Hello everybody and welcome to Chit Chat Tuesday. Uh, it's so nice to be on here again. I always look forward to these Chit Chat Tuesdays. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Neil Rushton, PhD, who um, is an author. Um, started off with a background in archaeology on ancient sites and history. Uh, he's a freelance author and has written, I believe, two books now. Have there more books than that? No, two uh, books. And uh, the most recent one, Dead Dreaming. And uh, you, or was that the other one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, de it's dead but dreaming, yeah. Dead but dreaming, oops. And uh, yeah, you might also have noticed Neil on some podcasts and also as well, he's uh, Kate Hergel Ray, who's uh, been interviewed on this channel before, co-host. And it's gonna be a fascinating one, like Kate Hergel Ray. Uh, Neil is uh, an expert and really knowledgeable in the Fae or fairies, depending on how you say. So with that, uh, say hello. Uh, and it's nice to see uh, Kate Hergel Ray here. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see Anne. And lovely to see Karen. And do come on and say hello. So Neil, thanks uh, for agreeing to be here. Um, are you happy to say your journey um, to begin with from being the archaeologist, the ancient sites, and also you went to uh, university in Cambridge and just how the interest in the faith first started please. Yeah sure it's uh, really great to be here thank you Paul for inviting me I, I really appreciate it and hello to everyone who's watching and in the chat and I hope, hope we get some questions which I'll try my best to answer as we go along. Um, so I was was an archaeologist I guess I am to, to some degree still an archaeologist but this was in the 1990s and I went to uh, initially for my BA and MA I went to the University of Southampton and this was doing an archaeology stroke history degree and I actually specialized in medieval history uh, and archaeology but there was quite a lot of prehistory in, in, in the BA, so I really got into the, the, the prehistoric stuff. And then in, let's try and get the years right, 1999, I went to the University of Cambridge to do my PhD, which was on a subject that we won't be talking about at all tonight. It was uh, basically the outer precincts of English medieval monasteries. Um, and how they conducted poor relief. That was the subject of uh, the, the PhD. But what that PhD did do was really teach me research techniques, how to investigate data and how to interpret data. And so even though it's a subject matter that I've left behind quite a few years ago, it has allowed me to bring that experience, knowledge, expertise into what I now study and have been studying for uh, about six or seven years, which is folklore. And most especially fairy folklore, because for reasons which I'll get into in a moment, this has always been the most interesting part of folklore for me. It's where I've, you know, it's a very major part of, certainly in the British Isles, and Ireland, fairy folklore is a major component of, uh, of, 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 of the folkloric whole. So that's just briefly what I did, that when I went to university, what I did. Um, but when I was, actually it was when I was at Southampton and we're talking about 1996, the, <laughs> the, the years kind of merge into one another when you get to a certain age, don't they? But it, it definitely was 1996, so I was still doing my BA uh, at Southampton, and some of it, as I uh, as I alluded to, was looking at prehistoric monuments, and I had a great interest in them. So I would tour around the country on my own or with a friend, just visiting the, the these monuments. And one of the very special prehistoric complexes in Britain is the Avebury complex in Wiltshire, near kind of south of Swindon. Uh, for anyone who, do, who doesn't know it, it's it, it's a basically a, a fossilized Neolithic landscape, which stretches over several thousand years during the near from the early Neolithic to the late Neolithic, and 
there there's obviously a Avebury Stone Circle, which is the biggest stone circle in Britain. It might be the biggest stone circle in the world, but don't quote me on that. Um, oh, uh, so I just we... say, can you just say if the sound's working, everybody? I have no sound issues. So I, so I, I just wanted to. So if you maybe Patricia log off and log back on again, I just wanted to flag that up. And I, I do apologise uh, to interrupt your uh, spiel. And, and, and Neil, I just wanted to see if anybody else was having that problem, uh, but it seems to be working. So yes, it's it's fine. So if you go back off, uh, Patricia, back on again, it should be working now. Lovely. So Avebury. <laughs> Avebury, yeah, right. Okay, back to Avebury if everyone can hear me. Um, so there's Avebury Stone Circle, there's Silbury Hill, there's the Stone Rose leading out from Avebury. There's a place called the Sanctuary, which is no longer existent but they're uh, you know, a very important site in relation to Avebury. And then there are two Neolithic long barrows. So we're talking about 3,500 BC. One's called East Kennet and one's called West Kennet. East Kennet has never been excavated and it's still there. Um, it will contain burials. Um, I don't know whether it will ever get excavated. It's, it's, it's quite a spooky site, actually. I've been on it once. And there's there's not a very good atmosphere there. There's something something was up for me, and I've heard many other people say the same thing about East Kennet Long Barrow. But about <clears throat> less than a kilometer away from East Kennet Long Barrow is West Kennet Long Barrow, and that has been excavated. It was excavated in the 50s by a famous archaeologist called Atkinson, and you can visit it. It's it's owned by English Heritage you take a path up from the road and it's it's, it's a bit difficult to explain it's if you, if you don't know what i mean the long but the reason it's called long barrow is because it's about 100 yards of earthen mound long with a frontage of enormous sarsen stones which form the entrance and then there is an entrance into a passageway and a chamber at the back with a couple of side chambers the burials were found in the side chambers of, uh, of, the, of the barrow, about 50 of them, which were all excavated and, and removed. Um, but it's much as it was excavated then in the, in the, in the 50s. And one day, in, I already, already knew about West Kennet and visited it several times, but one day in 1996, in the summer, I, I had just been getting into meditation uh, just to help me through some of the more stressful <laughs> aspects of university life. And I'd gotten into it and I decided to go to West Kennet Longborough on my own uh, at dusk, go into the central chamber at the back and try meditating. And so I did that. And after about 10, 15 minutes, uh, a, uh, a figure appeared in the front of the chamber. And the figure is one that I, I'll, sh I'll show you some images uh, a little bit later, which correlate to what that figure may have looked like. But in essence, it was a, a, a foot high humanoid with kind of gnarly features that walked towards me in that, in that chamber. With the chamber is about 10, 10, 15 yards long and it walks towards me and looked directly at me. And that experience lasted much less than a minute, maybe 30, 40 seconds, something along those lines. And then it walked back and just, ju just, it didn't disappear, but it kind of went to one side and behind a rock. And that was it. That was the last I saw of it. Now, that was my really, that was my first, what you could call supernatural experience. And it was, it was quite revelatory to me. Um, the, the, the feeling that I had was not a fear. You would think sitting in an ancient burial mound at dusk and a small humanoid figure comes towards you, you'd be fearful, maybe climbing the walls to get away. But it wasn't like that at all. There was a very calm, easy atmosphere about the place, probably because I'd been meditating for 10, 15 minutes. Um, the rational explanation for that might be oh well you fell asleep and it was a dream uh it was not a dream this happened i swear uh, 
swear that that ha that would happen and it took me a long time to talk to talk to people about that afterwards i told a close friend who, who was understanding and, and thought that well you know it's it's a supernatural experience and you should just accept it but i didn't tell anyone else for a long time and i certainly didn't tell any of my archaeological compatriots at university because well archaeology when you're doing a degree it's it, it can be quite materialistic quite reductionist and i didn't feel able to 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 go there with with that story and this this has resonance later on in my university life in academia when i started to get into the folklore and the fairies when i would mention this certainly to professors and supervisors they were adamant that you don't go there you will be discredited people will simply not believe you and think you're a, a bit of a head case and it will potentially ruin your career and i listened to them and i kept my mouth shut until such a time as maybe we'll come on come on to later where i left the archaeological world and felt more able and free to talk about not just my own experiences but my understanding of of the fairies and and fairy folklore and you know with you saying about that it, by talking about it would, would ruin your career it reminds me of a saying that i've heard several times only the closed mind is certain and i do find in certain spheres um they have a theory about how things were. And uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Maria Wheatley, probably might know Maria Wheatley. Yes. Yep. Uh, she says, and I've heard other people say as well, is that she thinks these bail chambers weren't just bail chambers. It was like if you went several thousand years in the future and come across a church and they have like weddings, christenings, all the other things, even fates now at churches and say, well, these churches just all about death because that's all they, they, they kind of can see with the bodies and things in it. That's a, that's a very good way. That's a very good analogy for these kind of Neolithic tombs. Of course, they're called burial chambers. They're, 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 they're they, they were for burials, there's absolutely no doubt about that, but there would be a whole range of ritualized purposes within them. They're, uh, one of the more creditable theories which, which you will hear is that they were a place of rebirth and there would be an initiation of some, someone, whether it coming into adulthood or about to get married, or, or any, uh, anything like that, they would go into the chamber to spend a night with the ancestors and in the morning they would be rebirthed out of that, that well, canal or passageway into a new person. And I think there's quite a lot of ethnographic evidence that that's, that still goes on in other parts of the world and I think that's a very reasonable thing to suggest that was going on at these places so yes we call them burial chambers but they were for much more than burials i'm going to read out before i get pat's question about west kennet longbarrow um julie hello to you lorna hello to you uh good to see you on here pat now with sound i realize i actually said if you go off and, and was explaining to pat when she couldn't hear which wasn't a very clever thing to do at all kelly how are you doing julian is here wendy is here uh, let's just skip forward. So uh, I think that's the names that say, but I can see there's lots of silent watchers, so do pop on if you're able to and say hello. Uh, Pat's curious to know what alignment is West Kennet on? West Kennet Long Barrow is more or less east west. It's not perfectly east west. Um, and so the frontage the, of, of the chamber will be aligned towards sunrise at a certain time of year. Like I can't remember what, what which day that would be, but if I'm thinking, let me think about it, it would be sort of southeast, so it would be more like an autumn or winter sunrise that would align directly with the opening of the chamber. And that's, that's, that's probably pretty important. Yeah, and uh, I will get to Kelly's question. Thank you for yours in a second. Well, Kelly's, um, what she's put here. Uh, but as well, uh, I've heard you say that they really knew what they were doing. I mean, when they created these, what we call burial chambers, uh, it would be a whole 
group of people, probably the villagers, a fair putting it together, and they knew exactly where they were where they were burying them. From your research and things like that, what kind of s specific uh, ingredients needed to be somewhere? So I'm making it sound like a cake here, but ingredients <laughs> need to be somewhere for one of these wonderful uh, places to be built. Uh, well, the first thing to remember is that. They would, it would have taken an extraordinary number of people hours, everything being done by hand. These stones in West Kennet, as well as in Avebury Stone Circle itself, are enormous. And they would have come from the Marlborough Downs, which are several miles away, and uh, an enormous amount of effort for what would have been a relatively small population. So when we think of prehistoric people living at subsistence level, that's not really correct because they wouldn't have had time or the energy or the means to be able to put these monuments together. Um, uh, so, 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 so that's the first, so, sorry, for, that's made me completely forget what the actual question was. <laughs> uh, so it was just saying what was the ingredients? Oh, why were they what, putting, yeah, why yeah, were they putting yeah. them together? Um, well, yeah. for start, the actual locations, um, the, the, pretty accepted theory is that, especially for long barrows, they were placed on the edge of tribal territories. And that's why East Kennet and West Kennet are so close to one another, because they were probably in uh, equidistant from a tribal territory. So that's the first thing. The other, the other, well, different Neolithic, especially Neolithic monuments, they differ. Sometimes you will find a stone circle, for instance, in a very high place and uh, a very naturally beautiful place. One especially I can think of is in Cumbria called Castle Rig. And you go to Castle Rig, it's quite a small stone circle, but it's an amphitheater of mountains around it. And it's obviously been chosen because it's so beautiful. Um, Avebury doesn't have an amphitheater of uh, uh, mountains around it, but it does seem to be placed in uh, a specific location close to the spring of the west uh, of, of sorry the Kennet River. So the Kennet Ringer River springs up at something called the Swallowhead Springs, which is close to Avebury, very cl and between West Kennet Long Barrow and Silbury Hill. People may have been seeing this picture. It's like a mound, like a pyramid, which was built shortly after West Kennet Long Barrow. And it's no coincidence that you've got this natural spring, these two enormous monuments on either side of it. You could speculate all day what the purpose of that was, but these these monuments were not located by accident. No, absolutely not. Um, if there's people joining in saying, hello, Charles is here, uh, Leah's here, Lee's here. Uh, Wendy's here. Did I say hello to Wendy before? Let's get Kelly's, um, what she put up here. I know where I live, there's going, there's going to, there was an archaeological dig and they found an Iron Age village up there and now they're going to be building houses. Uh, sounds about right. It's a shame, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's, it, that's not uncommon. It, it doesn't matter how important the site is. As you say, even an Iron Age village, which uh, is not common, there's mm -hmm. not many of them known in Britain. And most archaeology these days is developer driven. So you've got um, a developer comes in, wants to build a road, wants to build houses, anything. And then there will be uh, an archaeological condition put upon that development that you have to have an archaeological excavation or, or at least a survey done before that is allowed, before planning condition gets met. And uh, I used to do, as an archaeologist, I used to deal with this all the time. And it was very frustrating sometimes because they will give you a limited num amount of time. And something mm -hmm. like an Iron Age village, you could spend years excavating that to the proper standards. And if it's a developer funded dig, you'll have to do it in four weeks kind of thing mm. so yeah and well it's the way of the world i'm afraid and at least you do have those archaeological conditions so at least we can excavate find the evidence record it and it's there for posterity it's better than nothing 
Yeah, well, absolutely. And, and I'm glad there is at least, even though it's not enough time, some time to record some evidence there. But as you say, you know, a good couple of years would be ideal to really get everything. You never know even still what really important finds might be lost forever because of, uh, you know, the, the speed that it has to go through. Yes. Uh, Kate Hegel Ray says, I've got a very interesting photo of West Kennet uh, uh, with an angelic type light over the entrance. It's a very powerful place. I really like it. And um, they have like swallows. And is it swallows that are there? Or this, this uh, some birds? Uh, well, is it swallows or swifts? So it is one of the two. Swifts. I think it might be swifts, actually. That do nest. It's very cute little pictures. They love this perfect location for them, even though there's people going there all the time. It's, it's quite a well visited site, but they don't seem mm. to mind that. Uh, no. they're, they're up out the way on one of the top of one of the sarsen stones in one of the burial chambers. Um, mm. I've, 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 I've seen them. They're, I think that, you know, it's every year. It's, it's, it's very sweet. But um, Kate, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kate. I'm sure Kate will be asking some difficult questions tonight. Trying to, uh, <laughs> trying to, trying to undo me. But, <laughs> where, where, but West, West Kennet is, I've, I've seen that picture that Kate's talking about. And there is a very special atmosphere. And it's a very positive atmosphere as compared to East Kennet. Long Barrow, from my, mm. in my in my opinion and from my perspective, every time I've been to West Kennet and I've been there over a dozen times, it's 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 a special environment and I think it was made special by that experience I had in it that mm. time. It's never been repeated at, at West Kennet, but every time I go there, I have a very high resolution memory of that moment and that that little entity that came into my space for. 30, 40 seconds, and in many ways kind of changed my life. Good, yeah, I mean, that's, that's great when you have something that magical and special. Let me read this and then we'll go on to where you, you, you went from after having this experience at West Kennet, yeah. Longbarrow. Uh, just, yes, you do tend to think of sad or scary things happening in churches. I've never thought about that before that there are just as many happy occasions. I mean, I must admit, whenever I've been to a long bar, I mean, I, I, the energy always feels really nice and welcoming there. I never, I never come across one and, you know, I don't know if you're wondering, that actually feels spooky or scary. It actually seems a very peaceful, uh, restful, good vibe, good energy place, these long bars. What, what's your experience of the many, many more that you visited uh, to me? Um, or all of them. Uh, the, uh, apart from East Kennet, <laughs> East Kennet yeah. is, is is different. That might be because it's been un, it's unexcavated, and that the the bodies that will certainly have been buried there are still there, mm. and that may be they, whatever energetic resonance those ancestors of ours have there, just may not want you around, and it may just be a, a Kind of low-level warning to mm. get get away from it. But every other long barrow, there's another one, especially called Wayland Smith, Smithy in Oxfordshire on the Ridgeway, very similar to West Kennet, a little bit smaller. That's that's a beauty. That is a mm. beauty. And yeah, it's nice. and and uh, there, are, I, I know Kate had an experience at Wayland Smithy, and I've heard other people speak speak the same of that place. Again, very positive good energy about the place wonderful brilliant and uh, yeah i do i do like whaling smooth that's really nice as well i must say hello to cowabunga i hope you're doing uh good cowabunga um now so after that amazing experience that will remain with you um was it that you started doing your your research then or was it long after you decided to actually say about your experiences uh, as you were saying how blinkered and just one directional thinking it could yep. be in the academic world <laughs> yeah yes well uh -huh. obviously when you go to the level of phd it takes up your life and most of my life was spent doing the subjects that i was researching at the time medieval monasteries mm. but from that moment in 96 i started to get a real interest in folklore and as I, as I said at the beginning, I was warned off that. Don't don't try and interrelate folklore with archaeology, even though, mm. and here's my first book. I do have a pile of books that we'll be hopefully getting through, but here's, yeah. the, here's the first one, which is appropriate for this. 
And I, I think I read this around about that time, you know, mid 90s. And it's a book written in 1976 called The Folklore of Prehistoric Sites in Britain by an archaeologist called Leslie Grinzel. And but basically, as the, as the title suggests, he, he's relating folklore of all types that happens and has been recorded throughout the years up until 1976 when it was written at prehistoric sites. And oh, actually, actually, I was talking about Silbury Hill. The picture at the top is there's a picture of Silbury Hill, um, and it's 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 like a gazetteer, uh, but it's brilliant, and it completely enthused me into the idea that the folklore attached to these sites must be important. It's not accidental that all of this folklore is getting uh, attached to the to to these prehistoric sites, and many of the, the sorry much of the folklore that is attached is fairy folklore grinzel even has a, a distribution map all archaeologists have to have a distribution map at least once in in any book they write and there's a distribution map of fairies at um prehistoric sites overwhelmingly <coughs> at um neolithic sites but also some Br bronze age round barrows so bronze age we're, we're talking about like 2000 BCE through to about 800 BCE, so 3,000 years ago kind of thing. And by that time, they were building round barrows uh, for, 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 for burials, in this case, primarily for, for burials. And there's a shed load of folklore, especially fairy or folklore, att attached to these, to, 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 to these barrows. So that got me, but it was always on the back burner, the folklore for me because I've been warned off of it, because, you know, you, you haven't got time to be dealing with all of this. And it was only when I stopped being a professional practicing archaeologist in 2015 that I was able to, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about why in a moment, but it was only then that I was able to really start doing the research, using the research tools knowledge that I'd gained during the, the the degrees and the PhD and start to apply that to the folklore and start to write about it and so I start, start I started my blog which is called Dead But Dreaming and I started writing for various websites and ma magazines and getting deeper and deeper into the folklore especially fairy folklore partly again the fairies have been such of interest to me since that incident in 1996 that sparked it all but i guess well it took what's that almost two decades for it to come to come to proper fruition before i started to write about it and to, and talk about it on on podcasts etc um uh, yeah a couple of decades so it, so it took look that long for, uh, for for that to happen I'm going to, uh, there's two questions here, which I think might be kind of uh, related, so I'll show one and the other. But I just wanted to say, one's from uh, Patty, the other's from Kate. Uh, well, I wanted to uh, also ask, because you were warned off this uh, whilst you were doing your, your study and your, your, your learning at, at university and etc. Do you actually find, if you have a conversation with people, uh, that beneath what they're I'd say public persona is that there is an interest within these sorts of subjects. That's that's interesting. Uh, the answer is sometimes, mm. uh, obviously person dependent. So I'm. Uh, this is going to sound a little bit like name dropping now, and I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but many viewers will know of a chap called Mick Aston, who was on Time Team. He was the mm. he was the guy with the, with the grey hair, the sort of eccentric professor character. Yeah. And I got to know Mick quite well two years before his death in 2013. We did, we did a few projects together, became friends, and we would talk about this. And he was completely open to the folklore, but he would, and we'd have great discussions uh, about this, my own experiences. He would tell me about other people, not his own, but other people's experiences. And, but he would always say, don't tell anyone that I said this because I, 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 you know, it's, it's, 
as before, same with the professors and academics at university uh, who never t who were never talked to about it. They would be saying it's it's damaging to you. It just does. It just looks too hippy drippy, too new age. There's too much peripheral stuff around this subject matter, whereas archaeology is a science, and we need to, to need to keep it like that. So Mick Aston is is an example of someone who I did have many chats with about it. And I find after, since getting into the folklore and and writing about it and opening up the circle of people who, who are folklorists mostly or who simply write about folklore, ma many of them have been archaeologists as well. And they have had similar kind of experience to me in the well, I'd had enough of this stiff, rigid archaeological worldview where you're only allowed to talk about certain things. And I just had to get out of it. And I found myself becoming very interested in the folklore. I, 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 slightly off kilter here, but it is, it is very much related and a recent thing that's happened. I don't know whether people have seen Graham Hancock's new Netflix series oh, right. called Ancient Apocalypse. Now, Graham Hancock is, is a hero of mine. I absolutely love his work. He's very, very well researched, but he's coming up with some well, are they out there theories? His basic theorem is that there was an ancient civilization, a little bit like Atlantis. He doesn't really take it to Atlantis, but he talks about an ancient civilization um, before the last ice age, which was destroyed probably by a comet or mostly destroyed. And then the remnants of that civilization about 12,000 years ago came in to the, the rest of the world and that's why that's why we've got so many of these early monuments that's his basics that's his basic theory I and mean, he's made this netflix series about it the backlash the meltdown amongst the archaeological community is that they just can't stand it they basically want to censor it and i, I wasn't surprised it's, it, mm. it, i was surprised at the visceral quality of it the the, the backlash but it, it, it's there's an example of someone very well respected who has a theory which okay it's out of the archaeological mainstream but that's enough for the 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 academic archaeologists and their 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 lapdogs in the media to absolutely castigate him and desperately try to cancel him i think the guardian article said said something along the lines of this program shouldn't have been allowed incredible wow. It's incredible, yeah. and, and so obviously I'm not as a high level as Graham Hancock, but I, when when no. I saw this, I saw mm, there you go. Archaeology hasn't changed that much since 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 I left it, which is a bit of a shame. I, I think it is, and I'll just get cowbungs up when I read Pat's and and Hegel Ray's um, one out. But I, I kind of think, and I, I've heard it before. Uh, in fact, it was in a Lord Peter Whimsey book, and it's basically that you get people that have a theory. And they're so obsessed with this theory that they have, they're going to reject absolutely anything that doesn't fit in with their, their theory. Absolutely. Um, and, and, uh, so and, when you, and, when you, and when you get a whole community within academia who are running with this orthodoxy, if something comes out from the outside, they will um, circle the wagons in order to protect. Because, well, if you've built your career on something and someone comes along and says, sorry, that's wrong, and here's the evidence, you're going to mm. do everything you can to protect it, aren't you? Yeah, but that is a shame that it's it's so you know. Uh, I think that's oh, why I'm tragic. glad that. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why I'm glad I do the hypnosis and the NLP because there's lots of people with different views, very spiritual people in NLP, and the more kind of I don't yep. touch that kind of thing. So it's good that there is that, and you know I, I don't have a PhD to my name, so I don't feel constrained with that. So Carol Bunga says it's wonderful that you broke away from the limitations of academia and explored your interests. Feels so liberating. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to get up Pats and then Hergo Rays, which I think is very similar. So, are they usually on ley lines? Uh, we're talking about the ancient burial sites, and um, also it's not just the ancient burial sites. You know these other wonderful stone circles and, and things like that. And uh, Kate Hergo Ray says, "Why do fairies hang out in ancient sites?" <laughs> so I thought I put them both up because I'm wondering if there might be cooperation between both questions there. Yeah, well, in terms of the ley lines, uh, every so some people will be aware of a great author called Paul Devereux, who's written extensively on this, as well as their alignment with ancient sites. And 
I mean, there's another controversial subject, ley lines. Uh, say ley lines to an archaeologist and they won't speak to you. Um, but I, there, there are energy grids in, well, global energy grids. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, I've seen people dousing them. I've doused them myself. Uh, they are there. What they are, who knows? And here's another answer to, your, to, to a, a previous question. Why are they building them there in the first place? Maybe our ancestors, our Neolithic ancestors especially, were more able to tune in to these ley lines and nodal points on those ley lines and plug into the power plug into the power of those place, places so mm. um i would say yes to the ley lines correlation with ancient sites and if you want to know more about it search out paul devereux he's written a dozen books on, on the subject and he's very articulate very very wise on this on the subject and uh, as for kate asking uh, why fairies hang out at ancient sites mm. well there there's there could be lots of answers to that. Well, one, one possibility is that the fairies are actually representative of our ancestors. And if there's a powerful site, those ancestors may have some need to interact or interface with living humans for whatever reason. Why do they why do they not appear as human ghosts? Well, sometimes they do, but why do they appear as fairies? I think that could be answered in that the ancestors are different than us, and this is almost a symbolic way of them presenting themselves to us. And if the folklore is to believe, be believed, there is there's quite a systematic way of them looking so that's not a very good way of putting it sorry is that there's a, a kind of stereotypical folkloric fairy and um, we're not talking about wing tin tinkerbells here we're talking about right here's, here's time for another book so i can illustrate what i'm talking about excellent um this is a book by called fairies by brian frood and alan lee magnificent book it was published in 1978 and well i'll just give you a few examples of what we're looking at here there you go that one's called a red cap definitely not a wing tinkerbell here you go this is the best one actually that one is pretty close to what i saw in west kennet can you see that mm. yeah. so these are the kind of illustrations that brian fruit and alan lee were putting together in that book and they're not, act, they're, not, they're not conjuring that out of nothing. Brian Froude is quite a psychic person. And he, he's often stated that he's drawing what he's seen in nature. And they're always along that line, that kind of grizzled, small, humanoid. Not, actually, not always small. Some of them as, as large as a, a human. But they always have that humanoid quality. They're not quite human. And I think one of the reasons that they correlate with ancient sites is that some way they are a connection between us and the ancestors who knew about the specialness of those places now that's not that's not comprehensive this is this is that's the reason but i think there's definitely something in that and something that needs to be probably investigated further agreed um Charles says Tesla, so it's Nikola Tesla, knew about key lines and power grids. Uh, I believe Tesla, he did, yeah. Yeah, and I think that if Tesla was listened to more, uh, I think technology-wise we would be much more advanced than we are right now, personally. Well, I, I will put on my conspiracy theory hat on Excellent. And, <laughs> and say that uh, he was suppressed on purpose. Absolutely mm. no doubt about it. He knew some secrets. The powers that be took those secret, secrets, didn't want us to know about them, and stifled them so uh, mm. so we didn't know about him and him and his ideas, and he died penniless in a hotel in America. Horrible. Yeah. Amazing, amazing man. Uh, I mean, you know, if, if I, I know people that uh, absolutely love um, 
uh, their, their, their physics and uh, their technologies and things, but they haven't really heard of Tesla. So if yeah. anybody hasn't heard of Nikola Tesla, you, you have to go out and... Yeah, no, they, ju they, they just think it's a car. Yes, exactly. That's it, unfortunately. Uh, Pat says here, at midsummer, the Troop in Fay travel to Neolithic sites. So... Oh, this yeah, there's lo there's lo there's lots of folklore um, uh, about about trooping fairies going from one site to another. There is well, again, coming back to to Avebury, there's the the I think this is in Grinzel, where uh, a troop of them led by the fairy queen move from Silbury Hill to West Kennet Long Barrow, mm. and the the folklore is that d don't go near them because if they catch your eye you will become a fairy that's the folklore and there's a similar bit of folklore in between glastonbury and cadbury hill in somerset cadbury hill was is sometimes cited as the site of arthur's camelot and it's actually it's actually an iron age hill fort about about 12 miles from glastonbury i think and every midsummer the the arthurian knights sometimes described as fairies, sometimes just the Arthurian knights, will ride across the plain from Cadbury to Glastonbury. And again, this is a common motif in the folklore. Don't go near them while they're doing it. Don't meet their eyes and definitely don't talk to them because it won't end up well for you. Uh, yeah, and um, so, yeah, be warned about that one. Uh, Claire, hello to you. I hope you're doing really good. Uh, I mean, there's more books that uh, Neil's going to show us because uh, I know some people like to get their book list uh, going. Uh, but one, um, so was I thinking to say then? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'll you know just let me know okay. when, when I go th go th go. Yeah. It. So um, yeah, I, one of the things I've heard um, you sort of say about with Kate is that you sort of were meditating, and that sort of altered state uh, helped. As a hypnotherapist, um, is there any research in uh, hypnosis as well? And uh, you've had experiences um, with substances experiencing it and non-substance experiences it, yep. and people around uh, the world as, as well like that and the cor cor correlation between each of these people. Right, that, that's a that's big subject matter, Paul. Um, <laughs> We've got another three hours to go. Uh, yeah, we've got, <laughs> yeah, I can yeah, stretch it. <laughs> I'm the. Um, I don't know about the hypnosis. That's that's that is interesting. I have no recollection of anyone talking about fairy type entities in relation to hypnosis. So I I don't mm. know. To, to my view, meditation is a form of hypnosis, mm. self hypnosis. Uh, you 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 will yeah. You may you may do you may differ with me on that but it but i think it is isn't it it's a it's a way of altering your state of consciousness it's yeah it's a way of altering it's just, uh, the way i like to explain it is with meditation m mostly people kind of a posture holding their breath and you are going down to that sort of a lot of people go down to alpha state um whereas in hypnosis you go down to sort of theta uh sometimes delta so kind of can go really quite quite low with it sometimes and also as well I like to say hypnosis is a little bit more wet spaghetti so when I mean, people meditate they're kind of more held up right people in hypnosis are more kind of slumped down <laughs> <laughs> like this in, in their chairs that's good um, I'll, 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 re I'll remember that phrase yeah so. yeah <laughs> but but in turn but, in turn, but I think the the main issue yes. here is altered states of consciousness I yeah, write absolutely. about this a lot yeah. and I'm a firm believer that all of the stories and folklore that you, you can collect, all of the modern stories that you hear of people interacting or interfacing with the fairies, they are in some form of altered state of consciousness. Now, this doesn't have to be dramatic like meditation or hypnosis. Uh, it can be, you can be fearful, you can be joyful, you can be in grief, you can be depressed. Any emotion that takes you out of the everyday, everyday run of the mill state of consciousness and just tweaks it it's an enabler for an experience or can be an enabler for 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 an experience and well one of the most dramatic ways to alter your state of consciousness of course is to take a psychedelic and uh now now i'm not promoting the use of psychedelics it's a class a drug don't do drugs kids <laughs> but 
I have <laughs> certainly <laughs> taken psychedelics and experienced fairy entities while they were there, while, while I was, while I was uh, experiencing that psychedelic episode. And I'm definitely not the only person. There's massive literature on this that has expanded over the last decade or so. Um, some of you may know, well, this is longer ago than a decade, but some of you will know the the writer, author, philosopher, great person all round called Terence McKenna. And Terence McKenna was a very enthusiastic user of a substance called dimethyltryptamine, or usually known as DMT. And DMT is something, that, again, that's been studied enormously in recent years. It's even being used as clinical in clinical trials to treat depression and anxiety and PTSD. And it is a drug that will basically close down your waking consciousness and take you to another world every time without fail. And in that other world, as I've experienced twice, there are entities and they are more real than waking reality in my experience. It's an incredible experience. And then you, so you ask yourself, well, what are they? What, what, what are these, what are these entities? What, where, where are they? How can my consciousness get out from my brain and experience something that is so incredible? And the same goes for it, not just taking the psychedelic, but if it, it, the thing about DMT, you go to another world. Whereas most other psychedelics or meditation or hypnosis, you're still in this reality when the fairies come into this reality if you're having that experience. So what, what's, what's the explanation for that? That's, you know, I find this endlessly fascinating. And even though I've been writing about it for um, you know, six, seven years, I still haven't come to a bottom line about why altered states of consciousness are so important in provoking these fairy experiences of which there are now uh, you know, thousands and thousands, whether someone's been taking a psychedelic or experience them in other ways. There are many, many, many ways of, uh, of, of that kind of communication. And if, if I may, mm. can, I, can I just read, I, I always use, or always use this, yeah, I often use these, these three points, which, which are by um, a chap called Professor David Luke at the University of Greenwich. And he studies psychedelics and the effects on people. He's running various clinical trials with DMT at the moment. He's a great guy. Kate and I have interviewed them, interviewed him. He writes extensively on it. If you want to find out about this subject, he's the kind of go-to person. Now, he put these three points of, you know, what, what, what's happening? What, what, what are the fairies? Mm. Uh, and he's put three points. To, he's talking about fairy entities, especially on DMT, but it can be applied to any experience with the fairies and if you don't mind if i can just it won't take no, please do. These, these three points so number one they are hallucinations the entities are subjective hallucinations such a position is favored by those taking a purely materialist reductionist neuropsychological approach to the phenomena number two they are psychological transpersonal manifestations the communicating entities appear alien, but are actually unfamiliar aspects of ourselves, be they our reptilian brain or our cells, molecules or subatomic particles. And number three, the entities exist in other worlds and can interact with our physical reality. A numinous experience provides access to a true alternate dimension inhabited by independently existing intelligent entities in a standalone reality, which exists collaterally with ours and may interact with our world when certain conditions are met. The identity of the entities remains speculative. So the, mm. those three points, I mean, you know, brilliant, uh, you know, a, a, a run of the mill rationalist. Oh, well, it's number one, they're hallucinations without ever mm. trying to explain, well, what is a hallucination? Uh, mm. you know, that's just a get out clause, isn't it? Yeah. The transpersonal thing, that's interesting. You know, are they a part of the collective consciousness in, interacting with us? Are we touching a collective consciousness when this happens and everything is about human consciousness? Or is there a standalone reality, an interdimensional standalone reality which, which 
I would say when we alter our states of consciousness, we can interact with that standalone, interdimensional, separate reality. Uh, now, now that is coming from Professor David Luke. So there is some hope for academia. Uh, mm -hmm. People like him are, are, are speaking this language. Yeah. And it's a language which I find very useful. And to be honest, I'm, I haven't come to any firm conclusion, but I do come down on the side of number three most of the time. I think there is, I think there is a different reality that we can interface with when conditions, mm. uh, certain conditions are met. Well, also as well, that right now, the Wi-Fi waves are all around us having this conversation right now and television signals are right. And so maybe there's just something you can tap into in the brain that you can't see here, but we know there is Wi-Fi around us. We know there is television around us, yeah. you know, signals. Yeah. Around. So I think it could be something very, very similar. Uh, Claire has an image of Austin Powers in their head uh, at the moment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, so I just had that. So just anyone else got the image of Austin Powers in their head or is it just me? So. I don't. I don't really get the reference. Actually, yeah, that, that, that was a bit. That was a bit left field, actually. Awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. There's so that, that. That means something. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> please, 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 uh, please let us know, Claire. That would be brilliant. Uh, okay. So, if you encounter fairies in the other world, perhaps it's like shaman encounters spirits in the other world. Do you use some form of protection in case of negative experience? That's a great question. That is mm, a great question. No, I, I haven't even mentioned shamans yet, but of course, uh, well, coming back again to Graham Hancock's work, there's a book, 2005 book called Supernatural. It's actually been republished th this year in a different title, which I can't remember. But if you go and find that book, he talks uh, at great length about his ayahuasca trips uh, with shamans in the Peruvian and Brazilian jungles in the Amazon and the whole thing about that trip I mean it's become a little bit trendy now you know Westerners going off to the Amazon to say ayahuasca and there's, there's I, th I think there's a lot of chicanery going on there now but certainly 15 20 years ago that was not the case um, uh, and the guy I talked about before Terence McKenna was was that's that's how he got into all of this visit in the Amazon in the early 70s when things were very different um, and Graham Hancock talk and, and Terence McKenna and Graham Hancock talk about how the shamans the real Peruvian Amazonian shamans know how to take you through that trip and they will you know lecture you for 24 hours before it happens about the potential negative effects of meeting these entities which are always met on ayahuasca the main component uh, uh, um, psychedelic component of which is dmt so they they are very stringent in explaining to the participant that it can be dangerous and you've got to be careful about some of the more negative hostile entities that you may find in that place and that's the whole thing about you know these shamans know what they're doing they've had the generations of they're from generations of shamans who have been doing this for hundreds of years whereas someone in the west who picks up some dmt and like, well hey this is going to be great they don't give themselves the protection unless they do the research when i when before I took these substances, I did a lot of research and I read about the way these shamans talked about them. And even though I, I, I wasn't doing it as a shamanistic experience, I respected what they'd been telling the people who go into these states of consciousness because it's, it's important to do, to, do, to do that. And any decent shaman will, 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 will tell you that. Unfortunately, I think, like I say, it's become a little bit recreational in recent years. And I think it's, I think, I think it's dangerous. You see, I, I'm, I've read lots of, lots of reports. I've read quite a few reports from people coming back from, especially Brazil, who had terrible experiences on it and you, you know almost ptsd inducing experiences so yeah if, if if you're going to go into any of these substances whatever it is you've got to do your research you've got to listen to people who know what they're talking about and 
and can warn you about the potential dangers of of doing it. And this, this, this in some ways, this comes back to to the folklore of the fairies that we read about. I mean, it's mostly collected in the 18th and 19th century, but there had been an oral tradition of this fairy folklore going back to the Middle Ages. And there's a tradition of the main tradition of the fairies is that they were to be feared. You didn't go and invoke the fairies. You you avoided them at all cost. And often in these stories, there are tales of retribution, the fairies uh, doing nasty things to you. There's lots of, there's a very common motif of the fairies poking out your eye if they know you can see them. And that's very common British and Irish motif. And so, so there's always, always been in folklore, this warning of danger. If you're going to alter, if you're going to, either alter your state of consciousness or if you want to have any interaction with a fairy entity or a non-human intelligent entity you've got you've got to be careful you don't you just don't go running into it leaping into it thinking oh this is this is this is going to be great there is a tendency in some sort of new age communities to be invoking the fairies as though oh we're going to get the fairies to to come into our reality and help us tell us things and, and do things for us um I, that will usually end badly and i don't recommend it yeah no um yeah i think that i, I think the trouble is do you think that and i will get to, to uh, lorna's question in a second that the disney version of fairies has a lot to do <laughs> with that uh that they're all nice and that's it <laughs> Uh, that's an easy one. Yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, we've got. Um, well, I don't know who's to blame for the Disney stuff. Really, you could trace it back to some 19th century artists who start putting wings on fairies. I've never quite got to the bottom of why they started doing that. You don't get it before the 19th century, and then of course J. M. Barrie's Peter Pan with Tinkerbell, <coughs> which, which was the first kind of famous cartoon fairy which has been copied throughout the 20th century since and as you say it's the you know tinkerbell's lovely uh, actually T tinkerbell wasn't so lovely in the original john barry um play uh, mm -hmm. apparently i only found that out recently she was a little bit more of a deviant but since then it's become yeah fairy and again you say to most people fairies who you know nothing about the subject and their first thought will be tinkerbell or uh, you know, a Barbie doll kind of thing with, with wings. That Oh, that's a fairy mm. twinkling, um, granting you th three wishes. That's mm. just, uh, I, I think that's just, uh, I can't think of the word. It's, it's um, uh, uh, sort of s saccharization in the, in the 20th century. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit, a bit, bit load of rubbish, to mm. be honest. And, uh, and I, I often find myself explaining to people, oh, well, what do you do? Oh, well, I look into the folklore of the fairies and then I have to go, they explain to them what the, what the real fairies are and the fairies from folklore are. So we've got Lorna here, and I'll take it to talking about the shamans that we were talking about earlier. Are they able to bring you out of a state if you have a bad experience? Yes, they are. There's um, certainly with the ayahuasca in the Amazon, there is a substance which they will always have on hand. And if you're having just a dreadful experience, they will be able to just bring you out of it straight away. There's another example of why you know, people like that are to be trusted. They know what they're doing. Um, yeah. And I guess as well, <laughs> they probably get to suss the person out as well before if it's just somebody who's just going for a jolly sort of thing. Yes, no doubt about it. Uh, Carol Bang, given the potential dangers, do you suggest you have someone to guide you or be with you? Um, yes, there's uh, a, a common phrase in the psychedelic community, if I can call them that, is set and setting you've got to be in the right state of mind and you've got to be in the right place and that will often involve having someone you trust with you someone you really trust and certainly don't do it with strangers um it's i having having said that i've every psychedelic episode that i've ever gone through has been on my own i've never experienced it with anyone else but that's only because i've prepared myself as fully as possible before doing it and so in in some ways that preparation is almost like another trusted person but um generally yes uh and we were talking about 
alter states also as well, just a little bit more about uh, your eyesight and we can bring that into and, and what that has, has given you because uh, to begin with it was a very frightening experience for you I know so you can explain that process to us please. Well I, I've already told you that I stopped being an archaeologist in 2015 and that was because um, I lost quite a lot of my eyesight. Um, uh, I, my left eye had actually I'd already been blind with a, something called a retinal occlusion in my left eye since 2014 and then in 2015 I managed to fall down some steps, smash my head and the visual cortex was damaged with an oxygen block. So uh, my right eye was damaged as well which obviously was an extremely traumatic experience. Um, I haven't been able to drive a car since. There's lots of other things I can't do. It's been several years ago and I've kind of gotten over it. The eyesight hasn't gotten any better, but I'm able, I've adapted to it. And so, you know, I can I read as long as the print is big enough and I can get around, but there are certain things I can't do. So, in tw so when that happened, believe it or not, that happened on Halloween 2015. <laughs> and it was traumatic for certainly more or less throughout 2016. It was a horrendous experience. And um, uh, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. But something happened in early 2016, which was very, very interesting. And it's something that I subsequently found out from my ophthalmologist is something called Charles Bonnet syndrome. Charles Bonnet was a, a Swiss naturalist philosopher in the mid 18th century. And he's the first person who noticed this phenomenon of people who are losing their sight uh, or have a visual impairment will see beings will see entities of one sort or another and these entities can be all sorts from white ladies to children to animals to fairy entities and in early 2016 i'd say early february 16 16 for the first time as i was sitting in my cottage in somerset where i lived at the time uh, a group of entities entered the room and jumped up onto the sofa. They were very similar to the entity that I saw in West Kennet and slightly similar to the, the entities that I'd experienced on psychedelics. Um, now, I've, I've all, it, it's always fascinated me why I see them like that. Is that how they really appear? Is that what they really look like? Or am I predisposed having a knowledge of the fairy folklore and Brian Froude's illustration am I predisposed to see whatever energy pattern is entering the room at that time am I predisposed to see them as that because other people with Charles Bonnet syndrome don't necessarily see 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 that type of thing and um, this it's, uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome, th these experiences started happening regularly, maybe once a week. Sometimes it would go a couple of weeks without it happening, but they kept on happening and, uh, and continue to this day. And again, like the West Kennet experience, there's never been any fear. The feeling with them is always one of calmness. And there are often there are often voices attached to them in a kind of telepathic way. They seem to talk telepathically. And they, there is definitely an interaction and an eye contact between us. And they seem to be able to say things to me, but when I try to speak to them, they either just ignore it or they don't hear it. And one of the overriding things time and time again that they will say to me is stay calm drop your anxiety don't worry about it you know what could be worse don't worry always always in and, and there's not only the words but the feeling that is emanated from them when this is happening and a lot of people Charles Barney syndrome are terrified of it they think they're going mad the the they just want to get rid of it for me it's it's a very pleasant experience and it's been a therapeutic experience with the sight loss and I like it and I don't want it to go away. One, so lots of people say, have you ever tried to touch them? Is there any tactility there? 
Uh, the answer is no, because I can't. I would like to, but it feels incredibly inappropriate. It feels as though it just. I have the feeling if I try to do it, that's it. it well, I won't get mm. the experience in, anymore. Um, at the moment, they're doing something for me, and they seem to keep turning up. And um, uh, yeah, so, uh, and, and I like it. I, sh I should also add that it's not always entities. Sometimes it's just geometric pattern that appears a few seconds and then dissipates. Sometimes that geometric pattern forms into entities. And there's you. I can I can't think of a single occasion where there's only been one. It's always been more than one, two, three, four. And the this this uh, this experience will usually last uh, a minute, not not very long, and then they will disappear back into that geometric shape, and it's and it's done. This always happens on my own, uh, in always indoors, and usually in low light, which is that's pretty common for Charles Bonnet syndrome people. Yeah, and. Uh... You know, I do have a question, Lorna, what they do when they sat down. I mean, was that one of the first things when they came and sat next to you for that first time? Is that that they say, you know, stay yeah. calm? Yeah, and they rarely do anything. They they come in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people are going to think this is crazy. But, uh, you know, it's what happens. They, cut, they, they come in, they'll jump up on the arm or just stay on the floor. They'll wander around a little bit. They don't do much. They, do, they don't do much. There will be that kind of... Can't, uh, empathetic feeling that comes from them and it's as though that's all they're there to do they've come, they've come to calm me down if I'm in an anxious state uh, 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 and it does usually happen if I'm feeling particularly anxious about something it's more likely to happen I will go on about some anxiety in that in a little bit because I find it fascinating I think that I th if you're happy to a part two would be really good of this at some point in the future because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. we're only just scrape it's, it's, it's touching the surface of this uh, but Kate said if you could swap your life and become a fairy would you and what type would you be no I wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy to meet them but uh, they are of a different mm. they are of a different typology than us they are not human they have humanoid qualities, but they are, they are not like us. And to be wishing to be something that is not human, no, nah, I, 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 I wouldn't go there at all. It's, uh, I'm quite ha like I said, I'm quite happy to interact with them and have an interface with them and hopefully learn something from them, if, if at all possible. But um, uh, going into the fairy route, again, coming back to the folklore, lots of people disappear, do disappear into the fairy realm in folklore mm. and it rarely ends up well for them mm. it's uh there's a common motif of a mortal human people in the community think they've died and then someone else in the community goes somehow goes into fairyland and they find this person who they thought had died and basically they're the fairy servant they're being used and abused as uh, as a servant in fairyland because well they're just immortal so mm. Again, coming back to the fairies, don't always have our best interest in heart, at heart. Uh, my, my, with the Charles Barnet syndrome, mine seem to, but that's not always the case. So mm. be careful. Yes, indeed. Uh, Claire says, apart from the hoax photos of the Cottingley fairies, have you ever seen any other seemingly convincing photos or footage of fairies? And I'm going to just add to that: the one of the sisters, I think, still claims that the original photograph is genuine. And I That's, don't know what you think about that. that. Uh, oh, this is, well, well, again, we could talk about this all day. This is mm -hmm. Francis, uh, sorry, Elsie and Francis. El Elsie was 16, Francis was 9, 1917, Cottingley photos. They took these photos, which are obviously faked, um, and, show, and for a while they were taken, taken seriously. But the interesting thing about this story is what happened afterwards. Um, well, his, his, here we go. Jep, Jep. Uh, a guy called Geoffrey Hodson, who was part of the Theosophical Society, mm. went to meet them, and he wrote a report <coughs> to Conan, to Arthur Conan Doyle, actually, uh, talking about he was clairvoyant, and he went into the garden with the girls, and they saw fairies, and and gnomes, and elves, and all, uh, and all sorts. And then at the end of her life, I can't remember if it was Frances or Elsie. I always get them mixed up, but she wrote. Uh, a letter to a newspaper saying, "Yeah, of course we faked them," but mm. um, she did. And she said, "Actually, the last photo, the fifth photo, 
that's more real. That's that's not not faked. But more importantly, she said, we were just trying. We, we, we were trying to express what we were seeing every day in the gardens mm. and, we, and we couldn't photograph them. We tried to photograph them. You couldn't get a photograph of them. So they faked them. So that's the, that to me, that's the interesting part of the Cottingley fairy story. Mm. As, as for other photos, you've got to be very cautious with it because <clears throat> apart from CGI trickery, which is obviously prevalent, you, um, uh, I, I personally don't think that these whatever you want to call them interdimensional beings beings from a their own standalone reality non-material they can't be photographed you can see them through your consciousness but to try and put them onto a film uh, mm. uh analog or digital is not going to be possible and you see some pictures which are mm, yeah yeah that's that's interesting but uh, i've yet to be convinced mm. Uh, just uh, moving on to uh, this one a, a little bit. I wouldn't like experience of DMTR tablets. My doctor put me on uh, for non-essential tremors was enough. I only took three of the tablets. Non-essential tremors is a form of painkillers, <coughs> Parkinson's, there's no no cure. Um, I mean, there's I also other, I, sorry. I, I would say, uh, I've just noticed that my battery's running down. So excuse me while I, I move yeah. about the house. This is gonna be yeah. a little bit funky. <laughs> Uh, a little bit funky, but otherwise we're going to cut out. So I'm going to go dark as I go down the stairs. And if there's a big yeah. fall, call the police. Yes. Okay. <laughs> or an uh, ambulance. <laughs> yeah. Kate, do you have the address? <laughs> okay. Yeah, get in contact with Kate. Sorry yeah. about this. It's, um, I no, thank you for, uh, for, for carrying on should, with this. <laughs> should have plugged this in. There. I mean, my battery is so shot on this laptop now because you can't just change them now. You know, you, you, you wear them till you wear them out. It was before you could like go on eBay and get a spare one. Um, I can't yeah. now. So literally, if I don't plug it in, I've got about 20 minutes and then it's dead. So I, yeah. and for the first time ever, I forgot to plug it in the other day and, and it went dead. So I'm going to sort it out and get a new laptop and I think after Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a pain, isn't it? So, so, sorry yeah. about that. So, so. Can you see me okay? Can you... I can see you. So thanks for doing this. Much appreciated. Right, that's it. That's even worse with my reflection on my glasses. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, when I'm talking about uh, anything like DMT, um, it, it's not to be taken lightly. You know, any any kind of, you know, from pharmaceuticals or whether it's natural, even if it's like a, a mushroom, a psilocybin mushroom, perfectly organic, very natural, just, you know, you've got to do research. I mean, it's not for you. It's not for you. There's, um, you know, people ju just need to be careful. That's, that's all I can say, really. Uh, let's see what else is, have you seen? Oh, right, it's this one. Have you ever seen translucence fairies as I have? Charles, Charles Rudd. Um, th th they do have a translucent, th th some of the ones I experienced, they do have a translucent quality some so on, well, on the Charles Bonnet syndrome sometimes it's as though you can almost see through them and they're emitting their own light though those are the two things I, I, I would say um, yeah yeah um, and Kaubanga do you experience these beings in your dreams too they seem like guides Yes, in, in you know dream, dreams, we all know how dreams work and it's not quite the same, but I do frequently have dreams with these kind of beings in them. To, to be honest, in dreams, when they appear in my dreams, they are a little, um, a little bit more malevolent. There's a little bit more of a malevolence to them and they do have the tendency to actually morph into a human being who I know and I've often wondered if that human being I know it is the malevolent fairy trying to warn me about their some of their character traits but that's that, that's me being a bit paranoid mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting how they do appear different in the dreams to to when you've seen them 
in person. Do you know, I just pull this one up. I have been seeing your comments and I am sorry about uh, the tremors and what you've been experiencing. I wasn't sure when I first saw it if it was uh, just you want to have it privately and I didn't know if you would want it to be shared, but I have been seeing them. And thank you for your comments. It's much, much appreciated. Uh, I think it'd be about time now because I can't believe how uh, quick it's going. There's a couple more questions that I will uh, read out, but um, to, for people to know about your website, where you regularly blog uh, and your books. And if you can explain what your books, because your books are actually novels, um, at least one is. That's right. And so I'll explain about my blog site and that should just give me enough power to run back upstairs so I can <laughs> grab the books and show it to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it's just uh, adapting to the, to the occasion. I'm sure people will quite find it kind of amusing. Um, uh, so, so the blog site is called Dead But Dreaming. So that's all one word. I put it all in one word just because. Uh, Dead But Dreaming WordPress.com. And that's so I started that in 2016 when, as I've said before, when I started to get into this subject matter and wanted, I didn't just want to be writing for magazines and websites. I wanted my own consolidated blog site where I could say what I want. And I know there's no, I have complete editorial control. And so now there are about, I, th I think there's about 65, 66 articles. Actually, it might be up to 70 by now. But there's lo lots of articles. Most of them are by me. Some guest authors come on occasionally. And there I write. It, it's, I, I try to keep it, uh, uh, I call it a friendly academic style. It's not the dry academic style where every sentence is referenced to with an inch of its life. Uh, it's a little bit more journalese and just to try and make it a bit more readable to be honest but i do like to keep an academic tone to it so that people will realize that i'm talking seriously about about this subject it's not something that i'm i'm fripping with or or, or just messing about and it's a, a bit of a silly subject so uh so so that's where i write it the 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 most recent article, I should, I should just mention, we haven't had much time to, to go through the books that I was going to show you. We'll have to do that next time, Paul. If, Absolutely. Uh, yes, please do. It's been fascinating. We can, do, we can do that. But I must tell people about uh, a recent book by uh, Joshua Cutchin, who is a folklorist, very good folklorist. And if I just remember the name of his book, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because the latest article, which I published on Sunday, uh, is uh, a review of his book, which is called Ecology of Souls, A New Mythology of Death and the Paranormal. And um, uh, and so that, that's just an example of the latest, that, that I do occasionally do reviews of really good books, which I think are really important. And his is a very important book, which deals with fairies, aliens, and death. And it's an enormous 1500 page two volume book so it's serious 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 work so that that was the that was the latest um that was the latest blog post but i, I you know i usually I, I range from writing about pure folklore pure folkloric stories and trying to put some sort of interpretation over it through to uh stories of modern encounters and and putting an interpretation on, on that uh so please you know that's the best place to find me. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to give you my social media contacts. It, you, you just go to deadbutdreamingwordpress.com, and you'll find all my contact details there. And you can read the articles, and if 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 you like them, that's 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 fantastic. And now I'm just going to run upstairs. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Sorry, <is> Neil. <laughs> such, this is such an exciting. This is more exciting than most podcasts I do. So, <laughs> at least I won't run out of. Um, of battery and everything just goes black so uh, well sorry yeah. right it's not 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 a sensible thing to do with a visual impairment because uh i'm glad you <laughs> I, I was going to uh get get kate uh on facebook messenger you know just well <laughs> just say if, if it's just in case there's any fall or anything just in case um uh, uh 
Oh, thank you, Kaobonga Moose Spirits. That's yeah. very kind of you. Thank you. Yes, we will do. Thank you. So, um, so I've written two books. The first one came out in 2016, and some of you may recognise the Pink Floyd reference to the to the song called "Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun." This is actually out of print, and you can only get it on Kindle or second hand now. And uh, there are fairies in it, but it's quite a visceral book, and I, I'm all. I, I'm almost wary of recommending it people to go and find it because it's um, it's yeah it's I was going through a very bad time when I wrote the book and it really shows so if if you're feeling a bit blue and gloomy you don't read that book I, sh I should be saying it's not, not, I'm not recommending my own book <laughs> but I'd, much, I'd much rather you go and buy my second book which came out in 2020 which is the novel called Dead But Dreaming so there's there's the lovely cover um, by an artist friend of mine called Alenia Viola, oh, and that is about very briefly. It's about a young folklorist in nineteen <clears throat> in nineteen seventy who travels from London to the countryside. I never name where the countryside actually is, but it's obviously the English countryside, and they go down there to study fairy folklore and they stay in an adjunct to a psychiatric hospital and lots of strange things happen to them and i've tried i've tried to give the, the a, a very gentle touch with the fairies it's it's not a fantasy book i definitely wasn't writing a fantasy book it's very based on you know it's 1970 it's very real i've tried to evoke a lot of the atmosphere of the time and and the uh uh, so, so once they're down there, obviously the fairies come in, into it because they're altering their state of consciousness, even though they're not quite sure. There's a very, there's a very sort of devious psychiatrist who's in charge of the, the the unit that they stay in, and he's doing all sorts of things behind their back. I write it from the first person, so you're seeing this from the first person's perspective, and you're never quite sure. Well, I hope you're not never quite sure what's being done to them, and. Um, uh, and that's probably all I should say about it without giving a load of spoilers. But I'd, I'd, uh, if, you, if so, if you want to read the first novel, um, uh, uh, caveat emptor, buyer beware. Is that right? Caveat emptor. Um, but go and buy the second one, and you'll probably have a much better experience. And it's got, you know, it's got great reviews, and it actually sold really well. So I was very happy with that. Um, and those awesome. are my, uh, yeah, those are my two novels. Kate does say, uh, Dead But Dreaming is the only book I've read with a true meaning of fate outside f folk tales. Oh, thank uh, you, Kate. Kate. Kate always says such lovely things. She's great. Yeah. And uh, she also said earlier, you can see Neil on YouTube hair and the Hawthorne Kate. That, 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 Ray. Of, of course. So, sorry, Kate. There's, I, should, I should be mentioning that. We've been doing this for over a year together. I'm basically Kate's sidekick on hair and the Hawthorne. It's Kate's channel. You know, she's, she's the boss. And I just turned up. Um, so, so, uh, some someone called us um, the Mulder and Scully of the fairy world the other day. So uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyone amazing who knows the, the X Files. So um, so so do go to Hare and the Hawthorn on YouTube, and she, she, um, it, it, we really enjoy it. We get some great guests on, on, on there. We've had Anthony Peake, Joshua Cutchin, David Luke, Joe Hickey Hall. Uh, and and several others and and sometimes it's just kate and i talking about a, a certain subject and and we put those out regularly so do go along hair in the hawthorn on youtube yeah no it is good and i i do really enjoy that as well uh claire says that you're more than annika rice <laughs> before moving around <laughs> finding tonight's topic conversation extremely interesting thank you paul and neil uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think my bottom is quite up to annika rice's <laughs> Julian says it's been amazing as always, Paul. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, do that's absolutely fine. You did ask if you can uh, uh, message me afterwards. Yes, that's fine, Julian. Yeah, feel free to give me a message afterwards. Is absolutely brilliant. Uh, so we've only got about uh, seven minutes left. I can't believe how quickly uh, it's all it's all kind of gone. So um, I guess I'm going to say if somebody. Uh, I know there's a lot of people interested in in the fae and fairies, but if there's anybody that is just literally 
wanting to already have their appetite wet, wetted and that they're kind of thinking I want to look more into this. You've shown me some books or directions to go. Is there another book you can pull out for me? Another, another, I've, got, I've got about a dozen books down here and I've probably <laughs> got through, the, through any of them. But, um, let, right, this is, this is, can't, I'll do this as quickly as possible. Um, I, I, w I would say, I, sorry for the shameless promotion, but if you go to Dead But Dreaming, the website, you will um, get lots of information. I, I did one post on the literature of the fairies. So, you know, there's lots of links and every article has lots of links that you can follow up. Uh, so mm. that's a pretty good place to start. But yeah. um, I know it's a very unpopular thing to do these days, but people need to read books. You can't find everything on the Internet. Believe no, it or not. Indeed. Um, and that's very true when you talk about the fairy phenomenon. Now, uh, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to show this book because it's extremely hard to get hold of, but it is the best introduction to fairies. So that's an encyclopedia of the fairies by a folklorist called Catherine Briggs, who I think she died in 1980, but she's a very famous folklorist, the Folklorist Society, and wrote many fantastic books and this encyclopedia it was originally called the dictionary of fairies in 70, 1976 then it was published again republished as the encyclopedia of fairies in 1978 and it's basically a gazetteer of all sorts of fairies and and stories some interpretations she's brilliant it's a fantastic book it's it, it is the place to start if you're just starting up on on that kind of journey like i say unfortunately it's out of print and you, if you want to buy it, you're going to have to fork out about $200 for it, um, which it needs to be republished, obviously. But you can go down the library, get it on interlibrary loan or whatever, and, you know, there, there are available copies. Um, maybe, maybe I should, um, maybe I should uh, scan it and... I'd probably get done for copyright, wouldn't I? But yeah, somebody, be somebody, careful there. <laughs> somebody needs to scan it, make it into a nice PDF, so people have just got the information. Because it's mostly text; there's not many pictures in it. Yeah. Um, that that is the place to start. And if you want to, is it is an e more easily available book? Um, this is called The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, and it's by a chap called W. Y. Evans Vents, and he travelled around. He was an American who travelled around Britain, Ireland and Brittany in the Celtic parts of those countries in the early 20th century and interviewed the people in mostly rural areas who had a great belief in the fairies. They still believed in the fairies. Just at that special time, just before the First World War, where after the First World War everything changed. Technology took over, things became industrialised and people stopped believing in the fairies. So if you wanted some great stories and some slightly wacky interpretations by W.Y. Evans Vents um, that, you know, go and get this it's available in numerous editions. You can get it, get it anywhere. And so if that, that, and that will take you to the sources, someone who's investigated people who believed in the fairies and was able to drag out those, that, that source material. So I've, I've got a hundred other books, but that, that, that's, a, that's a good starting point, isn't it? Absolutely. Oh, it's, it's a fantastic starting point. And also as well with the, the PDF, you know, uh, it, it, it'll be a great way for us to all enjoy it because it's such a shame it's not in, in print anymore. I can't believe it hasn't been republished. There's a, there's a, there's a new dictionary of the fairies by someone called Morgan Daimler, who's an uh, American folklorist. And, that's, but that's not, that's, that, and she makes it very clear that she's not trying to rewrite Catherine Briggs's work. That's an easier one to find, obviously, because it was printed last year. But I can't believe that Catherine Briggs's um, Encyclopedia of Fairies hasn't been republished. It would uh, it would sell like hotcakes, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it shows how you know if somebody's going to put up for two hundred dollars on eBay in the USA, you know, it, it just shows how popular and people want it, not just like a 50, 50 pence book or something like that. Gillian right. uh, says it's, it always goes too fast, Paul. Maybe two hours next time with Neil. Well, after after checking with Neil if he's all right with that next time around being being that long and. Uh, yeah, but it's, it has been absolutely fascinating. Lorna uh, says, a fascinating topic. Charles says, uh, it's very interesting. Thank you, guys. So it's been absolutely amazing uh, tonight. Um, and thank you so much, Neil, for your knowledge, uh, your time, and, uh, you know, being with us. And uh, 
sharing your your your, your incredible fountain of knowledge with all, all that you've discovered read it, um, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure paul thank you very much it's as you say we've scratched the surface I always say this at the end of it, oh, we only scratched the surface, but it, it's true. Mm. There's so much more to say on this subject. You could go into some of the things we've talked about in much more depth. And um, I, I, I really, I, I've never done this live format with the, the, the chat on screen. And I really appreciate people, you know, tuning in and asking some really good questions. It's that's, I, I, I found that really, really enjoyable. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, Kate, Kate Hengore says, great as expected. Lovely. Well, I will say good night to everybody. Are you okay to stay on at the end, uh, sure. just for a little bit, just for a bit of a chat after? Sure. Um, next week is Lindsay and John from Exploring the Afterlife, because I've done all these interviews. I thought, not actually uh, interviewed Lindsay and John yet. And I had a little bit of an interview with them on Halloween night, and I thought it'd be good to delve and go deeper. So thank you, everybody. Uh, whatever you're doing tomorrow, have an outstanding day. And if it's your day, because I know people watching around the world, I hope that your day is fantastic and outstanding that's coming up for you. Thank you again, everyone, and I'll speak to you in a little bit. Bye.